Disc three. Chapter seven. I wonder now, sir, whether I believed at all in the firmness of the foundations of the new life I was attempting to construct for myself in New York. Certainly I wanted to believe, at least I wanted not to disbelieve, with such an intensity that I prevented myself as much as was possible from making the obvious connection between the crumbling of the world around me and the impending destruction of my personal American dream. The power of my blinders shocks me, looking back. So stark in retrospect were the portents of coming disaster in the news, on the streets, and in the state of the woman with whom I had become enamoured. America was gripped by a growing and self-righteous rage in those weeks of September and October as I cavorted about with Erica. The mighty host I had expected of your country was duly raised and dispatched, but homewards, towards my family in Pakistan. When I spoke to them on the telephone, my mother was frightened, my brother was angry, and my father was stoical. This would all pass, he said. I found reassurance in my father's views, and I dressed myself in them, as though they were my own. Are you worried, man? Wainwright asked me one day in the Underwood Samson cafeteria, resting his hand on my shoulder in a gesture of concern as I filled a bagel with smoked salmon and cream cheese. No, I explained. Pakistan had pledged its support to the United States. The Taliban's threats of retaliation were meaningless. My family would be just fine. I ignored as best I could the rumors I overheard at the Pak Punjab Delhi. Pakistani cab drivers were being beaten to within an inch of their lives. The FBI was raiding mosques, shops, and even people's houses. Muslim men were disappearing, perhaps into shadowy detention centers for questioning or worse. I reasoned that these stories were mostly untrue. The few with some basis in fact were almost certainly being exaggerated. And besides, those rare cases of abuse that regrettably did transpire were unlikely ever to affect me because such things invariably happened in America as in all countries to the hapless poor, not to Princeton graduates earning $80,000 a year. Thus, clad in my armor of denial, I was able to focus, with continuing and noteworthy success, on my job. After the exceptional review I received for my performance in the Philippines, I had become Jim's fair-haired boy. He offered me another assignment on one of his teams, this time valuing an ailing cable operator. The firm was based in New Jersey, to which I began a daily commute, and had been hit hard by the decline in investor sentiment surrounding the technology sector in general and small-scale broadband providers in particular. It was barely able to service its debts and had become a prime candidate for acquisition. On this occasion, our client was unconcerned with the potential for future growth. No, our mandate was to determine how much fat could be cut. Call centers, it was evident, could be outsourced. Truck rolls could be reduced. Purchasing could be consolidated with our client's existing operations. The potential for headcount reduction was substantial. And hence, the reception our team received from the employees of the company was frosty indeed. Our telephone extensions and fax machines would mysteriously stop working. Our security badges and notebooks would disappear. Often, I would emerge into the car park to find that one of the tires of my rental car was punctured, far too often for it to be mere coincidence. Once this happened when Jim had come out for the day, he had asked me to give him a ride back to the city. He shook his head as I brought out the spare. Don't let her get you down, Changez, he said. Time only moves in one direction. Remember that. Things always change. He loosened the metal strap of his watch, a solid diver's chronometer, and let it slide to his knuckles. When I was in college, he went on, the economy was in bad shape. It was the 70s, stagflation, but you could just smell the opportunity. America was shifting from manufacturing to services, a huge shift, bigger than anything we'd ever seen. My father had lived and died making things with his hands, so I knew from up close that that time was past. 
He refastened the clasp of his watch. Then he made a fist and twisted his thick forearm from side to side slowly until the instrument found its level. There was an almost ritualistic quality to his movements, like a batsman, or even, I would say, a knight, donning his gloves before striding onto a field of contest. The economy's an animal, Jim continued. It evolves. First, it needed muscle. Now, all the blood it could spare was rushing to its brain. That's where I wanted to be. In finance. In the coordination business. And that's where you are. Your blood brought from some part of the body that the species doesn't need anymore. The tailbone. Like me. We came from places that were wasting away. I had finished replacing the tire, so I shut the boot and unlocked the doors. Most people don't recognize that, kid, he said, buckling himself in beside me and nodding his head in the direction of the darkened building we had left. They try to resist change. Power comes from becoming change. I considered what Jim had said, both that evening on the drive to Manhattan and in the weeks that followed. There was a certain ring of truth to his words, but I was uncomfortable with the idea that the place I came from was condemned to atrophy. So I dwelled instead on the positive aspect of his little sermon, on the idea that I had chosen a field of endeavor that would be of ever greater importance to humanity and would be likely, therefore, to provide me with ever-increasing returns. I also found myself better equipped to regard as misguided, or at least myopic, the resentment which seethed around us as we went about our business that autumn in that New Jersey corporate park. But it would not be true to say I was completely untroubled. There were older people among the workers of the cable company. I sometimes sat near them in the cafeteria, although never at the same table. The seats beside our team always went untaken. And I imagined many of them had children my age. If English had a respectful form of the word you, as we do in Urdu, I would have used it to address them without the slightest hesitation. As it was, the nature of our interactions left me with minimal scope to show them deference, or even sympathy. I remarked upon this to Wainwright on one of the many weekend nights we found ourselves spending at the office, and he said, You're working for the man, buddy. Didn't anyone tell you that at orientation? Then he gave me a tired smile and added, but I get where you're coming from. Just remember, your deals would go ahead whether you worked on them or not. And focus on the fundamentals. Focus on the fundamentals. This was Underwood Sampson's guiding principle, drilled into us since our first day at work. It mandated a single-minded attention to financial detail, teasing out the true nature of those drivers that determine an asset's value. And that was precisely what I continued to do, more often than not with both skill and enthusiasm. Because, to be perfectly honest, sir, the compassionate pangs I felt for soon-to-be-redundant workers were not overwhelming in their frequency. Our job required a degree of commitment that left one with rather limited time for such distractions. But then... In the latter part of October, something happened that upset my equanimity. It was shortly after Erica and I had abortively attempted to make love, perhaps a day or two later, although I can no longer precisely recall. The bombing of Afghanistan had already been underway for a fortnight, and I had been avoiding the evening news, preferring not to watch the partisan and sports event-like coverage given to the mismatch between the American bombers with their 21st century weaponry and the ill-equipped and ill-fed Afghan tribesmen below. On those rare occasions when I did find myself confronted by such programming, in a bar, say, or at the entrance to the cable company's offices, I was reminded of the film Terminator, but with the roles reversed so that the machines were cast as heroes. What left me shaken, however, occurred when I turned on the television myself. 
I had reached home from New Jersey after midnight and was flipping through the channels looking for a soothing sitcom when I chanced upon a newscast with ghostly night vision images of American troops dropping into Afghanistan for what was described as a daring raid on a Taliban command post. My reaction caught me by surprise. Afghanistan was Pakistan's neighbor, our friend, and a fellow Muslim nation besides. And the sight of what I took to be the beginning of its invasion by your countrymen caused me to tremble with fury. I had to sit down to calm myself, and I remember polishing off a third of a bottle of whiskey before I was able to fall asleep. The next morning, I was, for the first time, late for work. I had overslept and woken with a cracking headache. My fury had ebbed, but much though I wished to pretend I had imagined it entirely, I was no longer capable of so thorough a self-deception. I did, however, tell myself that I had overreacted, that there was nothing I could do, and that all these world events were playing out on a stage of no relevance to my personal life. But I remained aware of the embers glowing within me, and that day I found it difficult to concentrate on the pursuit, at which I was normally so capable, of fundamentals. But listen... Did you hear that, sir? A muffled growl, as if of a young lion held captive in a gunny sack? That was my stomach protesting at going unfed. Let us now order our dinner. You would rather wait, you say, and eat upon your return to your hotel? But I insist. You must not pass up such an authentic introduction to Lahori cuisine. It will, given the dishes for which this market is justifiably renowned, be a purely carnivorous feast, one that harks back to an era before man's knowledge of cholesterol made him fearful of his prey, and all the more delectable for it. Perhaps, because we currently lack wealth, power, or even sporting glory, the occasional brilliance of our temperamental cricket team notwithstanding, commensurate with our status as the world's sixth most populous country, we Pakistanis tend to take an inordinate pride in our food. Here, in old Anarkali, that pride is visible in the purity of the fare on offer. Not one of these worthy restaurateurs would consider placing a Western dish on his menu. No, we are surrounded instead by the kebab of mutton, the tikka of chicken, the stewed foot of goat, the spiced brain of sheep. These, sir, are predatory delicacies, delicacies imbued with a hint of luxury, of wanton abandon. Not for us the vegetarian recipes one finds across the border to the east, nor the sanitized, sterilized, processed meats so common in your homeland. Here, we are not squeamish when it comes to facing the consequences of our desire. For we were not always burdened by debt, dependent on foreign aid and handouts. In the stories we tell of ourselves, we were not the crazed and destitute radicals you see on your television channels, but rather saints and poets and, yes, conquering kings. We built the royal mosque and the Shalimar gardens in this city, and we built the Lahore fort with its mighty walls and wide ramp for our battle elephants. And we did these things when your country was still a collection of thirteen small colonies gnawing away at the edge of a continent. But once more I am raising my voice, and making you rather uncomfortable besides. I apologize. It was not my intention to be rude. In any case, I ought instead to be explaining to you why I did not speak to Erica of my fury at seeing American troops enter Afghanistan. After that night, when we celebrated in my bed her obtaining an agent, I had no contact with Erica for several days. She did not answer when I rang, and she did not respond to my messages. I was hurt by this behavior, taking her silence for inconsideration, and I arrived in a reproachful mood for the drink that she eventually did invite me to. I was utterly unprepared for what I saw. At the counter was a diminished Erica. Not the vivid, confident woman I knew, but a pale, nervous creature who could almost have been a stranger. She seemed to have lost weight, and her eyes darted about the bar. 
It was not until she smiled that something of the old Erica glimmered within her, but her smile left her face as quickly as it had come. My consternation must have been evident, because she smiled again and said, Do I look that bad? Not at all, I lied. Just tired, perhaps. Have you been unwell? Yeah, she said. I'm sorry I didn't get back to you sooner. That's quite all right, I said. I hope I was not a pest. Never, she said. I've been going through a bad patch. It's happened before, but it hasn't been like this since the first time, after Chris died. We ordered, beer for myself and a bottle of water for her, and I considered giving her an embrace but decided against it. She seemed too brittle to be touched. What happens is, she went on, my mind starts to go in circles, thinking and thinking and then I can't sleep. And once a couple of days go by, if you haven't slept, you start to get sick. You can't eat. You start to cry. It just feeds on itself. I've got some stronger stuff from the doctor, so I've been sleeping again, but it isn't real sleep. And the rest of the day I feel like I'm out of it. Like when you get off a plane and you can't hear properly. Like that, except it's not just my hearing and I can't pop my ears. She took a sip of her water and managed to wink at me. Then she said, Freaky, huh? I stood there in silence, unable to think of what to say or even to offer her a smile. I was horrified. But she was waiting for me to respond, so I said, But what is it you think of that causes you to become so upset? I think of Chris a lot she said. And I think of me. I think of my book. I think some pretty dark thoughts sometimes. And I think of you. What do you think of, I asked, when you think of me? I think it isn't good for you to see me so much right now, she answered. I mean, it isn't good for you. No, I reassured her, although I was frightened. I want to see you. That's what I mean, she said, looking into my eyes with great seriousness. Do you get it? That's what I mean. I did not get it in the least, and I asked her to come home with me. I don't think I should, she said. Really. But there was a softness in her expression, and when I continued to insist, she finally did acquiesce. During our taxi ride, my mind struggled to comprehend what was happening. I had, over these past weeks, sentimental and old-fashioned as it may sound, but then I was raised in a family where brief courtships were the norm, been indulging in daydreams of a life as Erica's husband. Now I found not just those daydreams, but the woman herself vanishing before my eyes. I wanted to help her, to hold on to her. Indeed, I wanted to hold on to us and I was desperate to extricate her from the maze of her psychosis, but I did not know how to proceed. In my bed, she asked me to put my arms around her, and I did so, speaking quietly in her ear. I knew she enjoyed my stories of Pakistan, so I rambled on about my family in Lahore. When I tried to kiss her, she did not move her lips or shut her eyes, so I shut them for her and asked, are you missing Chris? She nodded, and I saw tears begin to force themselves between her lashes. Then pretend, I said. Pretend I am him. I do not know why I said it. I felt overcome, and it seemed suddenly a possible way forward. What? She said, but she did not open her eyes. Pretend I am him. I said again, and slowly, in darkness and in silence, we did. I do not know how to describe my experience of what happened next. I cannot, of course, claim that I was possessed, but at the same time I did not seem to be myself. 
It was as though we were under a spell, transported to a world where I was Chris and she was with Chris and we made love with a physical intimacy that Erica and I had never enjoyed. Her body denied mine no longer. I watched her shut eyes and her shut eyes watched him. I can still recall her muscularity, made more pronounced by her gauntness and the near inanimate smoothness and coolness of her flesh as she leaned back and exposed to my touch her breasts. The entrance between her legs was wet and dilated, but at the same time oddly rigid. It reminded me, unwillingly, of a wound, giving our sex a violent undertone despite the gentleness with which I attempted to move. More than once I smelled what I thought to be blood, but when I reached down to ascertain with my fingers whether it was her time of the month, I found them unstained. She shuddered towards the end, grievously, almost mortally. Her shuddering called forth my own. You're a kind person, she said afterwards as we lay there. It sounds like a stupid thing to say, but it's true. I held her and did not reply. I felt something I have not felt before or since. I remember it well. I felt at once both satiated and ashamed. My satiation was understandable to me. My shame was more confusing. Perhaps by taking on the persona of another, I had diminished myself in my own eyes. Perhaps I was humiliated by the continuing dominance in the strange romantic triangle of which I found myself a part, of my dead rival. Perhaps I was worried that I had acted selfishly and I sensed, even then, that I had done Erica some terrible harm. But this last explanation is, I hope, unlikely. Surely I could not have known what would happen to her over the weeks and months to follow. Erica fell asleep that night without medication. I remained awake, in part because I had not yet eaten. I hesitated to rise and go to the refrigerator for fear of disturbing her, but her sleep was deep, like that of a child, and eventually I managed. I ate only bread and drank only water, a tasteless meal, but I kept at it until my belly was full, and when I returned to the bed it was as though I had a tight drum strapped to my front, which forced me to lie on my side. It is impossible to tell, sir, given the gloom about us and the unexpressive cast of your face, but I suspect you are looking at me with a degree of revulsion. Certainly I would look at you in such a manner if you had just told me what I have told you, but I hope your disgust has not banished your appetite, for I am summoning our waiter to take our order. Tonight, I can assure you, our meal will be anything but tasteless, and here he comes. Good man. Chapter 8 I observe, sir, that there continues to be something about our waiter that puts you ill at ease. I will admit he is an intimidating chap, larger even than you are, but the hardness of his weathered face can readily be accounted for. He hails from our mountainous northwest, where life is far from easy. And if you should sense that he has taken a disliking to you, I would ask you to be so kind as to ignore it. His tribe merely spans both sides of our border with neighboring Afghanistan and has suffered during offenses conducted by your countrymen. Is he praying, you ask? No, sir, not at all. His recitation, rhythmic, formulaic, from memory and so, I will concede, not unlike a prayer, is actually an attempt to transmit orally our menu, much as in your country one is told the specials. Here, of course, there are no specials. The excellent establishment of which tonight we are patrons has in all likelihood prepared precisely the same dishes for many years. I could translate for you, but perhaps it would be better if I selected a number of delicacies for us to share. You will grant me that honor? Thank you. There, it is done, and off he goes.
I had been telling you of my disquiet on the night I finally made love to Erica, a night that ought, were ours a more normal relationship, to have been one of great joy. She left before dawn, waking with a start and insisting that she return home despite my requests that she stay. Once again, considerable time would pass before I heard from her again. My calls went unanswered, my messages unreturned. I had learned my lesson, and I desisted from attempting to make contact. But once a fortnight had gone by, I tried again, and was rewarded by a response. She apologized, as she had previously done, for disappearing in this fashion, and she said she thought it best, perhaps, for her, but certainly also for me, that we try not to see each other too often. And she consented to my request that we meet. But come over to my place, she said. I don't feel up to going out. I was greeted at the door to Erica's apartment by her mother, who ushered me into an antechamber, which featured, among its antique decorations, a bonsai tree and a harpsichord, and said, I think we need to chat. Erica has told you about her history, yes? I nodded. Well, she went on, her condition has come back. It's serious. What she needs right now is stability. No emotional upheavals. You get me? I can see you're a nice young man, and I know she cares about you. But you have to understand that she's a sick girl at the moment. She doesn't need a boyfriend. She needs a friend. She looked at me beseechingly. I understand, madam, I said. I will do whatever you think best for her. Thank you, she said. Then she smiled and added, It's easy to see why she likes you. That conversation had a considerable impact on me, not so much for what was said, although I was alarmed by this grave characterization of Erica's situation, but for how it was said. Erica's mother's tone was one of quiet desperation, and it frightened me. I entered Erica's room tentatively, attempting to steel myself against what I might find. What I found was not at first particularly alarming. Erica reclined on her bed, pale, yes, as though she had a fever, and with hair that had gone some time since it was last washed, but seemingly in good spirits. She patted the space beside her and offered me her forehead to kiss as I sat down. We spoke for a while, as though nothing unusual had happened, and we were meeting under the most ordinary of circumstances. I told her about my project in New Jersey, the negative reaction to our presence by the employees of the cable company, Jim's words of advice, and about the day-to-day -day occurrences in my life since she had seen me last. She told me about her doctor and her medication, how the drugs made it difficult to concentrate, and so her days seemed to slip away with nothing to show for them. Given the relaxed manner in which she described it, an observer would have been forgiven for thinking that her condition was not serious and she was on the mend, until I asked about her novel. I immediately regretted doing so. Her eyes began to wander and her voice became less sure. I can't seem to work on it, she said. Every time I try, I just get upset. I haven't been taking my agent's calls. Poor guy, he must think I'm a lunatic. I remarked that writers were known to be eccentric, and so it was unlikely her agent was particularly perturbed, and then I tried to change the subject, but she would not have it. It doesn't help anymore, she said. I used to turn to it, my writing, when I needed to get something out that was stuck inside but I can't get it out now. It pulls me in, you know? I dwell on it instead of writing it. I tried to prevent myself from asking her what it was, whether because I thought it would upset her or because I thought it would upset me, I do not know, but I failed. It's whether there's something left, she explained, suddenly and unsettlingly calm or whether it's all already happened. How can I describe to you, sir, how much her words disturbed me? 
She glanced away and I saw her recede into her mind. I placed my hand next to hers, hoping, as I had done innumerable times in the past, to lure her out of her thoughts. I watched our skin, mine healthy and brown, hers sickly white, separated by a distance not greater than the width of an engagement ring, but she did not notice me. I waited for my proximity to make itself felt to her. A minute passed in this fashion. Then she removed her hand from where it lay and, without ever looking in my direction, covered it with her other hand on her lap. When Erica's mother entered shortly thereafter, I did not feel she was interrupting. No, she was not preventing the continuation of a discussion between her daughter and myself. She was merely bringing to an end my intrusion on a conversation Erica was having with Chris, a conversation occurring on some plane I could not reach or even properly see. Erica waved a goodbye to me as I left her room, but she did so with her face averted so I could not meet her gaze. Her mother thanked me for coming and asked me to wait for Erica to contact me before coming again. And with that, and a gentle kiss on the cheek, the door to the elevator was shut upon me, and I began to travel down the shaft alone. I returned to my apartment and spent that night in semi-darkness, in the glow of the city's lights entering through my windows, wondering as I would wander for many months thereafter, indeed, as I sometimes wonder to this day, where Erica was going. I never came to know what triggered her decline. Was it the trauma of the attack on her city? The act of sending out her book in search of publication? The echoes raised in her by our lovemaking? All of these things? None of them? But I think I knew even then that she was disappearing into a powerful nostalgia, one from which only she could choose whether or not to return. For it was clear Erica needed something, that I, even by consenting to play the part of a man not myself, was unable to give her. In all likelihood, she longed for her adolescence with Chris, for a time before his cancer made her aware of impermanence and mortality. Perhaps the reality of their time together was as wonderful as she had, on more than one occasion, described to me. Or perhaps theirs was a past all the more potent for its being imaginary. I did not know whether I believed in the truth of their love. It was, after all, a religion that would not accept me as a convert. But I knew that she believed in it, and I felt small for being able to offer her nothing of comparable splendor instead. I did not see Erica again that year. Thanksgiving soon gave way to the chill of December, and every week, every day, I thought of calling her but prevented myself from doing so. Her mother had, of course, asked me to resist, and I suspect I thought, given the catastrophic progress of our relationship thus far, that imposing myself on her interior struggle would only do her harm. But I must admit that my motives were not entirely noble. There were in me at least some elements of the anger and hurt vanity that characterize a spurned lover and these unworthy sentiments helped me to keep my distance. Still, I remained concerned for Erica's well-being, and remained also in the grip of a certain, probably irrational, hope. So the ongoing task of abstaining from communication was a struggle not unlike that of a man attempting to rid himself of an addiction. Possibly this was due to my state of mind, but it seemed to me that America, too, was increasingly giving itself over to a dangerous nostalgia at that time. There was something undeniably retro about the flags and uniforms, about generals addressing cameras in war rooms and newspaper headlines featuring such words as duty and honor. I had always thought of America as a nation that looked forward. For the first time, I was struck by its determination to look back. Living in New York was suddenly like living in a film about the Second World War. I, a foreigner, found myself staring out at a set that ought to be viewed not in technicolor, but in grainy black and white. What your fellow countrymen longed for was unclear to me. A time of unquestioned dominance, of safety, of moral certainty? I did not know. 
but that they were scrambling to don the costumes of another era was apparent. I felt treacherous for wondering whether that era was fictitious and whether, if it could indeed be animated, it contained a part written for someone like me. But what is that? Ah, your unusual telephone beeping a demand for your attention. No, sir, I do not mind in the least. Please proceed to key in your reply. It occurs to me that you have been contacted with the precision of an old church bell tower, by which I mean precisely on the hour. Perhaps the company is checking up on you? No, you need not answer. But now that your response has been sent, allow me to direct your gaze to that grill, where at this very moment our boneless chicken pieces are being set to roast. Observe the sparks that fly from the coals, angry and red as our cook fans the flames. It is quite a beautiful sight, you must admit. And with it will soon come... There. Do you smell it? The most mouth-watering of aromas. I had been telling you of the nostalgia that was becoming so prevalent in my world at the onset of the final winter I would spend in your country. But one notable bulwark continued to hold firm against this sentiment. Underwood Samson, which occupied most of my waking hours and which was, as an institution, not nostalgic whatsoever. At work, we went about the task of shaping the future with little regard for the past, and my personal efficacy continued to grow as I immersed myself in my project at the cable company, hoping, in this way, to leave behind the many worries that preyed upon me when I was free to ruminate. I suspect I was never better at the pursuit of fundamentals than I was at that time, analyzing data as though my life depended on it. Our creed was one which valued above all else maximum productivity. And such a creed was, for me, doubly reassuring because it was quantifiable and hence knowable in a period of great uncertainty and because it remained utterly convinced of the possibility of progress while others longed for a sort of classical period that had come and gone, if it had ever existed at all. I detected a change in my attitude to my colleagues, a greater understanding of what drove them to focus so completely on their professional lives. And perhaps, as a consequence, it seemed for a while that my popularity at the office was on the rise. Yet, even at Underwood Sampson, I could not entirely escape the growing importance of tribe. Once I was walking to my rental car in the parking lot of the cable company when I was approached by a man I did not know. He made a series of unintelligible noises. A kala malakala, perhaps, or kalapal kalapala, and pressed his face alarmingly close to mine. I shifted my stance, presenting him with my side and raising my hands to shoulder height. I thought he might be mad or drunk. I thought also that he might be a mugger, and I prepared to defend myself or to strike. Just then, another man appeared. He too glared at me, but he took his friend by the arm and tugged at him, saying it was not worth it. Reluctantly, the first allowed himself to be led away. Fucking Arab, he said. I am not, of course, an Arab, nor am I, by nature, a gratuitously belligerent chap, but my blood throbbed in my temples, and I called out, Say it to my face, coward, not as you run and hide. He stopped where he was. I unlocked the boot, retrieving the tire iron from where it lay. The cold metal of its shaft rested hungrily in my hands, and I felt, at that moment, fully capable of wielding it with sufficient violence to shatter the bones of his skull. We stood still for a few murderous seconds. Then my antagonist was once again pulled at, and he departed, muttering a string of obscenities. When I sat in my car, my hands were unsteady. I have, in the uniforms of the various teams for which I have played, had my share of fights, but this encounter had an intensity that was for me unprecedented, and it was some minutes before I deemed myself fit to drive. What did he look like, you ask? Well, sir, he... But how odd. I cannot now recall the man's particulars. His age, say, or his build... 
To be honest, I cannot now recall many of the details of the events I have been relating to you. Uh, but surely it is the gist that matters. I am, after all, telling you a history. And in history, as I suspect you, an American, will agree, it is the thrust of one's narrative that counts, not the accuracy of one's details. Still, I can assure you that everything I have told you thus far happened, for all intents and purposes, more or less as I have described. In any case, let us not allow ourselves to be diverted. Some days after the incident in the parking lot, close to the end of our project at the cable company, I was again driving back to Manhattan with Jim. It was late and we were both hungry. He suggested, as I was dropping him off, that he pan-fry us a pair of tuna steaks. His flat was not the conservative, Upper East Side, livery, doorman sort of place one might have expected. It was instead in Tribeca, a 4,000-square-foot loft that occupied the top floor of a nondescript building on Duane Street. Entering for the first time, I was struck by its fashionable quality, the sense it conveyed of attaching great value to design. Not that it was cluttered or indeed feminine in any way. No, if anything, it was a minimalist affair with cement floors and pipes conspicuously fastened to the ceiling. But each piece of furniture seemed perfectly curated, lit and positioned just so, and the walls featured impressive and forceful works of art, including, I realized, a not insignificant number of male nudes. Jim rolled up his sleeves and asked, over the sizzle of our fish, what was on my mind. I sat at a stool, separated from him by the bar of his open-plan kitchen, which served also as a surface for dining. Nothing, really, I said. Is your family not at home? He turned to me, visibly amused, and said, I'm not married. Ah, I said, no children? No children he affirmed. But you're dodging my question. What do you mean? I asked. You haven't been yourself lately, he said. You're preoccupied. Something's eating at you. If I had to guess, I'd say it's your Pakistani side. You're worried about what's going on in the world. No, no, I said, shaking my head to dismiss any possibility that my loyalties could be so divided. Things at home are a little unsettled, but it will pass. He seemed unconvinced. Is your family okay? He asked. Yes, I said. Thank you. All right, then, he said. But as I've told you before, I know what it's like to be an outsider. If you ever want to talk, give me a shout. I left Jim's flat, hoping I had thrown him off the scent. Still, my apparent transparency was alarming. Jim was a particularly perceptive observer, but if my internal conflicts were evident to him, then perhaps they were evident to others as well. I had heard tales of the discrimination Muslims were beginning to experience in the business world, stories of rescinded job offers and groundless dismissals, and I did not wish to have my position at Underwood Sampson compromised. Besides, I knew that our firm, like much of our industry, had seen a sharp downturn in activity levels following the September attacks, and Wainwright had shared with me a rumor that cutbacks were on their way. Our project at the cable company went on to end well, in the sense that we identified substantial cost savings and our client was pleased by the thoroughness of our valuation. But I was a nervous young man on the day of my December review. As it turned out, I need not have been so concerned. Two of the six analysts in my entering class, those ranked fifth and sixth, were indeed among the employees our firm let go. But I, Jim informed me, was once again ranked number one. I was, in fact, awarded a prorated bonus that, although not enormous by the standards of our profession, was still rather generous given the expectation of lean times ahead. It enabled me to pay off in full my outstanding student loans and put aside a few thousand as well. I should have been ecstatic, but earlier that week armed men had assaulted the Indian parliament and instead of celebrating my good fortune, I was confronting the possibility that soon my country could be at war. My mother told me not to come. My father said much the same. 
But with the help of a 7th Avenue travel consolidator and my sudden ability to afford business plus class airfare on PIA, I found myself bound for Lahore at that time of the year when New York shoppers busy themselves with the purchasing of last-minute presents, and couples can be seen kissing on the streets as they drag beautiful little shrubs to their apartments for use as Christmas trees. I sat on the airplane next to a man who removed his shoes, much to my dismay, and who said, after praying in the aisle, that nuclear annihilation would not be avoided if it was God's will, but God's will in this matter was as yet unknown. He offered me a kindly smile, and I suspected that his purpose in making this remark was to reassure me. And with that, sir, the moment has come for us to eat. For your own safety, I would suggest that you avoid this yogurt and those chopped vegetables. What? No, no, I meant nothing sinister. Your stomach might be upset by uncooked foods, that is all. If you insist, I will go so far as to sample each of these plates myself first, to reassure you that there is nothing to fear. Here, a piece of warm bread, like so. Ah, fresh from the clay oven. And I will begin. Chapter 9 Will they provide us with cutlery, you ask? I am certain, sir, that a fork can be found for you. But allow me to suggest that the time has now come for us to dirty our hands. We have, after all, spent some hours in each other's company already. Surely you can no longer feel the need to hold back? There is great satisfaction to be had in touching one's prey. Indeed, millennia of evolution ensured that manipulating our meals with our skin heightens our sense of taste, and our appetite for that matter. I see you need no further convincing. Your fingers are tearing the flesh of that kebab with considerable determination. There are adjustments one must make if one comes here from America. A different way of observing is required. I recall the Americanness of my own gaze when I returned to Lahore, that winter when war was in the offing. I was struck at first by how shabby our house appeared, with cracks running through its ceilings and dry bubbles of paint flaking off where damp had entered its walls. The electricity had gone that afternoon, giving the place a gloomy air. But even in the dim light of the hissing gas heaters, our furniture appeared dated and in urgent need of reupholstery and repair. I was saddened to find it in such a state. No, more than saddened. I was shamed. This was where I came from. This was my provenance. And it smacked of lowliness. But as I reacclimatized and my surroundings once again became familiar, it occurred to me that the house had not changed in my absence. I had changed. I was looking about me with the eyes of a foreigner, and not just any foreigner, but that particular type of entitled and unsympathetic American who so annoyed me when I encountered him in the classrooms and workplaces of your country's elite. This realization angered me. Staring at my reflection in the speckled glass of my bathroom mirror, I resolved to exercise the unwelcome sensibility by which I had become possessed. It was only after so doing that I saw my house properly again, appreciating its enduring grandeur, its unmistakable personality and idiosyncratic charm. Mughal miniatures and ancient carpets graced its reception rooms. An excellent library abutted its veranda. It was far from impoverished. Indeed, it was rich with history. I wondered how I could ever have been so ungenerous and so blind to have thought otherwise, and I was disturbed by what this implied about myself, that I was a man lacking in substance and hence easily influenced by even a short sojourn in the company of others. But far more significant than these inward-oriented musings of mine was the external reality of the threat facing my home. My brother had come to collect me from the airport. He embraced me with sufficient force to cause my ribcage to flex. As he drove, he ruffled my hair with his hand. I felt suddenly very young, or perhaps I felt my age, an almost childlike twenty-two. 
rather than the permanent middle age that attaches itself to the man who lives alone and supports himself by wearing a suit in a city not of his birth. It had been some time since I had been touched so easily, so familiarly, and I smiled. How are things? I asked him. He shrugged. There is an artillery battery dug in at the country house of a friend of mine, half an hour from here, and a colonel billeted in his spare bedroom, he replied. So things are not good. My parents seemed well. They were more frail than when I had seen them last, but at their age that was to be expected with the passage of a year. My mother twirled a hundred-rupee note around my head to bless my return. Later it would be given to charity. My father's eyes glistened, moist and brown. Contact lenses, he said, dabbing them with a handkerchief. Quite smart, eh? I said they suited him, and they did. His glasses had come late in life, and they had concealed the strength of his face. Neither he nor my mother wanted to discuss the possibility of war. They insisted on feeding me and hearing in detail about my life in New York and my progress at my new job. It was odd to speak of that world here, as it would be odd to sing in a mosque. What is natural in one place can seem unnatural in another, and some concepts travel rather poorly, if at all. I censored any mention of Erica, for example, and a deed of anything I thought might disturb them. But that night a family banquet was held in my honor, and there the conflict with India dominated conversation. Opinion was divided as to whether the men who had attacked the Indian parliament had anything to do with Pakistan, but there was unanimity in the belief that India would do all it could to harm us, and that despite the assistance we had given America in Afghanistan, America would not fight at our side. Already the Indian army was mobilizing, and Pakistan had begun to respond. Convoys of trucks, I was told, were passing through the city, bearing supplies to our troops on the border. As we ate, we could hear the sound of military helicopters flying low overhead. A rumor circulated that soon traffic would be halted on the motorway so that our fighter planes could practice landing on it in case all of our airfields were destroyed in a nuclear exchange. It will perhaps be odd for you, coming as you do from a country that has not fought a war on its own soil in living memory, the rare sneak attack or terrorist outrage accepted, to imagine residing within commuting distance of a million or so hostile troops who could, at any moment, attempt a full-scale invasion. My brother cleaned his shotgun. One of my uncles stocked up on bottled water and canned food. Our part-time gardener was deployed with the reserves. But for the most part, people seemed to go about their lives normally. Lahore was the last major city in a contiguous swath of Muslim land stretching west as far as Morocco, and had therefore that quality of understated bravado characteristic of frontier towns. But I was worried. I felt powerless. I was angry at our weakness, at our vulnerability to intimidation of this sort from our, admittedly much larger, neighbor to the east. Yes, we had nuclear weapons, and yes, our soldiers would not back down, but we were being threatened nonetheless and there was nothing I could do about it but lie in my bed unable to sleep. Indeed, I would soon be gone, leaving my family and my home behind, and this made me a kind of coward in my own eyes, a traitor. What sort of man abandons his people in such circumstances? And what was I abandoning them for? A well-paying job and a woman whom I longed for but who refused even to see me. I grappled with these questions again and again. When the time came for me to return to New York, I told my parents I wanted to stay longer, but they would not hear of it. Perhaps they sensed that I was myself divided, that something called me back to America. Perhaps they were simply protecting their son. Do not forget to shave before you go, my mother said to me. Why, I asked, indicating my father and brother, they have beards. They, she replied, have them only because they wish to hide the fact that they are bald. Besides, you are still a boy. She stroked my stubble with her fingers and added, It makes you look like a mouse.
On the flight, I noticed how many of my fellow passengers were similar to me in age, college students and young professionals heading back after the holidays. I found it ironic. Children and the elderly were meant to be sent away from impending battles, but in our case it was the fittest and brightest who were leaving, those who in the past would have been most expected to remain. I was filled with contempt for myself, such contempt that I could not bring myself to converse or to eat. I shut my eyes and waited, and the hours took from me the responsibility even to flee. You are not unfamiliar with the anxieties that precede an armed conflict, you say? Aha! Then you have been in the service, sir, just as I suspected. Would you not agree that waiting for what is to come is the most difficult part? Yes, quite so, not as difficult as the time of carnage itself, said sir like a true soldier. But I see that you have paused in your eating. Perhaps you are waiting for fresh bread? Here, have half of mine. No, I insist. Our waiter will bring us more momentarily. Given your background, you will doubtless have experienced the peculiar phenomenon that is the return to an environment more or less at peace from one where the prospect of large-scale bloodshed is a distinct possibility. It is an odd transition. My colleagues greeted with considerable, although often partially suppressed, consternation my reappearance in our offices. For despite my mother's request, and my knowledge of the difficulties it could well present me at immigration, I had not shaved my two-week-old beard. It was perhaps a form of protest on my part, a symbol of my identity, or perhaps I sought to remind myself of the reality I had just left behind. I do not now recall my precise motivations. I know only that I did not wish to blend in with the army of clean-shaven youngsters who were my co-workers, and that inside me, for multiple reasons, I was deeply angry. It is remarkable, given its physical insignificance, it is only a hairstyle after all, the impact a beard worn by a man of my complexion has on your fellow countrymen. More than once, travelling on the subway, where I had always had the feeling of seamlessly blending in, I was subjected to verbal abuse by complete strangers, and at Underwood Samson I seemed to become overnight a subject of whispers and stares. Wainwright tried to offer me some friendly advice. Look, man, he said, I don't know what's up with the beard, but I don't think it's making you Mr. Popular around here. They are common where I come from, I told him. Jerk chicken is common where I come from, he replied, but I don't smear it all over my face. You need to be careful. This whole corporate collegiality veneer only goes so deep. Believe me. I appreciated my friend's concern, but I did not take his suggestion. Despite the layoffs, the utilization rate at our firm remained low in January, and I sat at my desk with little to do. I spent this time online, reading about the ongoing deterioration of affairs between India and Pakistan, the assessment by experts of the military balance in the region and likely scenarios for battle, and the negative impact the standoff was already beginning to have on the economies of both nations. I wondered how it was that America was able to wreak such havoc in the world, orchestrating an entire war in Afghanistan, say, and legitimizing through its actions the invasion of weaker states by more powerful ones, which India was now proposing to do to Pakistan, with so few apparent consequences at home. I also, after six weeks of attempting not to communicate with her, finally called Erica. And because her phone was constantly off, followed up by sending an email. I would like to claim my message was brief, a polite hello that was for the most part respectful of her request for silence, but in truth I spent many hours composing it and it was perhaps the lengthiest I have ever written. In it, I told her of what had happened in my life, both at work and at home, and the turmoil through which I was passing. I also told her how much I missed her, and that I did not understand where or why she had gone. It was some days before she replied. I'm at a sort of clinic, she wrote, an institution where people can recover themselves. I think of you too. She invited me to come and visit her.
it would be easier for her to attempt to answer my questions face to face. The clinic was an afternoon's drive from the city, a converted villa set in 50 acres of secluded countryside overlooking the Hudson River. I was greeted by a nurse in the reception area. You must be Changez, she said. Erica has told me a lot about you. I am, I said. How did you know? Eyelashes like a Maybelline ad, she replied. That's what she said. As I considered this unlikely description, the nurse explained that Erica had been waiting for me, but became a little nervous and went for a walk, asking the nurse to explain a few things on her behalf. So she will not see me? I asked. The nurse smiled. Sure she will, honey, she said. But people get embarrassed sometimes when they're in a place like this. She thinks it won't be as awkward for you both if I talk to you first. She patted my hand. Then she added, I'm like the shower you take before you jump into a swimming pool. What I had to understand about Erica, the nurse told me, was that she was in love with someone else. She knew it would be tough for me to hear, but I had to hear it regardless. It did not matter that the person Erica was in love with was what the nurse or I might call deceased. For Erica, he was alive enough. And that was the problem. It was difficult for Erica to be out in the world, living the way the nurse or I might, when in her mind she was experiencing things that were stronger and more meaningful than the things she could experience with the rest of us. So, Erica felt better in a place like this, separated from the rest of us where people could live in their minds without feeling bad about it. But eventually she will have to leave here, I said. Perhaps she will want to be with me then? The nurse shook her head. Maybe, she said. But right now you're the hardest person for her to see. You're the one who upsets her most, because you're the most real, and you make her lose her balance. The nurse suggested I was likely to find Erica at the end of a path that wound through the wooded grounds in a small copse on a hilltop. She was indeed there, sitting on a bench of rough-hewn timber. She wore a heavy jacket and turned at my approach. She was gaunt, her flesh seeming almost bruised passed over the bones of her face, and she glowed with something not unlike, unlike the fervor of the devout. She extended her hand, but instead of shaking it, I kissed it, my lips touching the synthetic polymers of her winter glove. She smiled. You look cute, she said. Your beard brings out your eyes. I thought she looked like someone who was about to complete the month of fasting and had been too consumed by prayer and reading of the holy book to give sufficient thought to the nightly meal but I did not say so. She offered me her arm, and we strolled together, speaking softly. The mist of our breathing preceded us. This is a good place for me right now, she said. I feel calm here. You seem calm, I said, resisting the urge to add, too calm. I'm sorry I've been hiding, she said. It's not that I haven't wanted to see you. It's just that I could see I was pulling you in, and I didn't want you to get hurt. I thought it would be better for you like this. Why would I get hurt? I asked. It hurts when you care about someone and they go away, she replied. But where are you going? I asked. She shrugged and did not answer. We walked on in silence but for the sound of snow crunching under our feet. My ears began to ache from the cold. Do you write here? I asked. No, she said. Not in the sense of putting stuff down, but I think a lot. I imagine. And do I sometimes figure in your imaginings? I asked. Sometimes, she said, smiling. Any fantasies of kinky sex, I said, with an exotic foreigner given to role-playing? She laughed and squeezed my arm. 
For the first time, her face seemed to soften, to become almost vulnerable. But then she again receded inside herself. You helped me, she said. You were kind and true, and I'm grateful. It was the certainty with which she placed me in the past tense that struck me most about her statement. I felt hope being quenched within me, and although I said, Do not be grateful, be lustful, come back to New York with me, I said it without that core of conviction that gives words their power. She leaned her head momentarily against my shoulder, but she was not compelled to respond. I watched her out of the corner of my eye as we made our way to the main building together, wondering how much of her detached and seemingly ascetic state was a consequence of the medication she was consuming. For a moment, I was seized by the wild notion of abducting her and taking her away with me in my rental car. Surely my ministrations would be more productive in restoring her to reality than the chemicals she was subjecting herself to here. But the absurdity and disrespect to her of such an act was immediately obvious to me, and I did nothing of the sort. Do you know how to ski? she asked me. No, I said, I have never been. Chris and I, she said, used to go every winter. Colorado, usually, or once in a while, Vermont. We even did a little cross-country together in Central Park when we were kids. We each got a pair as a present, and we snuck out with them without telling anyone. We got into trouble. Our parents called the police. It was fun, though. Anyway, this place reminds me of that. Especially the snow on that slope. It's so gentle, and it seems so soft. You should go sometime. We had reached the gravel of the driveway. You should take me, I said. She shook her head. I can't, she said. But you should still go. Try to be happy, okay? I'm sorry about everything. Please take care of yourself. She gave me a hug, and afterwards she stood there looking at me. But he is dead, I wanted to shout. It was all I could do not to kiss her then. Perhaps I should have. I had to choose whether to continue to try to win her over or to accept her wishes and leave. And in the end, I chose the latter. Maybe, I told myself as I drove away, it was a test and I failed. Maybe I should have risked it. I almost turned around and went back, but in the end, I did not do so. Things might have worked out rather differently if I had turned around. Then again, things might have worked out exactly the same. I cut a desolate figure in the office after that, angry and preoccupied with thoughts of Erica and of home. I was negligent at my administrative duties and did absolutely nothing to seek out a new assignment for myself. I half expected someone to come to my desk with a pink slip to put me out of my misery. Instead, Jim summoned me to issue a surprising stamp of approval. Listen, kid, he said. Some people around here think you're looking kind of shabby, the beard and all. Quite frankly, I don't give a shit. Your performance is what counts as far as I'm concerned, and you're the best analyst in your class by a long way. Besides, I know it must be tough for you with what's going on in Pakistan. What you need is to get yourself busy, which I'll admit isn't easy when we have as dry a pipeline as we do right now. But I've got a new project, valuing a book publisher in Valparaiso, Chile. It's going to have to be a small team, just a vice president and an analyst. Normally, I'd offer it to someone with more experience, but I'm offering it to you. What do you think? Thank you, sir, I muttered. He laughed. A bit of enthusiasm, please, he said, adding, it's a lot of responsibility. There won't be any backup for you. You can rely on me, I said, this time with what I hoped was greater apparent sincerity. I do not know if I succeeded, however, because although Jim smiled in response, his expression was one of puzzlement. But I observe that you, sir, have stopped eating. Can it be that you are full? 
Very well, I will not insist. I will, however, order us some dessert, a little rice pudding with sliced almonds and cardamom, the perfect sweetener for an evening such as ours, which is taking a turn towards the grimmer side. Such dishes may not normally be to your taste, but I would encourage you to have, at the very least, a tiny bite. After all, one reads that the soldiers of your country are sent to battle with chocolate in their rations, so the prospect of sugaring your tongue before undertaking even the bloodiest of tasks cannot be entirely alien to you. End of Disc 3